Welcome everyone to Art of Ism, the power of art for social transformation. Today we have with us Vicki Rosenthal. Vicki Rosenthal is a creative of social justice advancing advocacy through art using authentic stories to create understanding and equity. She focuses on social impact through community involvement projects, public art, and individual custom work. Additionally, for artwork sold, 10% of net profits are invested back to grassroots causes. This year, she illustrated her first children's book and has an ongoing exhibition at Plunge Beach Resort in Lauderdale by the Sea. In February of 2023, Vicky created and curated a month long exhibition on Immigration Broward Cultural Division, BCD Artist Support Grant, creating a community art project and wall mural installed at, installed at speaker, sorry, not installed at the newly constructed LA Lee YMCA Mizell Community Center. She gave a presentation as an invited guest alumna, alum and showed at three artist exhibitions. Presently, Vicky is working with asylum seekers who want to share their stories, offering the public greater understanding of firsthand persecution, bringing more acceptance towards asylum seekers and challenging biased news media. Asylum seekers hope to create awareness and empathy toward their plight in order to live their lives with autonomy and self-sufficiency. Thank you for being our artist for today, Vicki. Take it away. You are on mute. Vicki, you are on mute. Okay, great. I found the screen. Sorry. And also, am I sharing my screen yet? No. Not yet. Okay. Let me get back to that. Hmm. All right. Sorry. No worries. Okay. Let's go back here. And... Thought I was all set up. Now, once I get onto full screen, I can't. All right, maybe I can do go back to Zoom again and do this. Excellent. Yay. You Got can it. Right and the screen. Good. Whew. All right. Thanks, everybody. I um you probably have seen my face before because after finding out about artivism and then attending one presentation and getting inspired, I just kept attending all of them because there's so such, such amazing work being done and learning from everyone is so inspiring. So I'm really glad I had a chance to be a part of that and now get to share my work. It's pretty much the way that I look at my work is kind of like life. We live our lives and we just do and we learn and, you know, get opportunities. We take advantage of them and things like just add up. And all of a sudden uh, things come together and it's like, oh, I need to do this. So that's somewhat how I started my art business. And let me see how to move to the next screen. It should just go great. So my beginnings was uh, growing up in South Georgia. And this picture here with Ray Charles shows the Georgia, um, state of Georgia. And I grew up um, in a very, like a small, small town in South Georgia. And it just seemed that, you know, I took art lessons and just did my thing. And um, and everything you know went along smoothly, except I was like, I I didn't realize 
how secluded and how much I didn't know about the world, even living in the South and it being somewhat uh, divided with white and black communities um, being separated. Um, I, I I'm probably just lived in a bubble and I didn't really understand. And um, then later, you know, on, I just did my life. I started school in college and then dropped out and then worked odd jobs. And it, it just seemed like it was my path. I didn't worry about it. I took care of, you know, paying my bills and just went along as life opened up. But all along, I continued to do art is uh, would work, you know, would just make pictures for or birthday cards or things like that for family and friends and would attend art classes because I loved it. I never felt compelled to be an artist in a sense of running my own business. Uh, I just did art on the side and loved it. Um, so in 2018, after graduating, um, going back to college and university and getting my social work degree, and I got the social work degree not as to be a therapist, um, because I call that like um, micro level. There's micro, meso, and macro. I wanted the macro level. I wanted to change systems. I felt like that's where my calling was and wanted to make a difference in the world in knowing that things aren't right and systems need to change because of um, inequities in our world. So I got a social work degree. I, because I didn't, uh, as part of the uh, curriculum uh, or core work that I needed to do, I needed to pick a foreign language. And I live in South Florida now. And when I was choosing my foreign language, the um, advisor says, why are you wanting to learn French? Because, you know, mostly the, we have a lot of Spanish people, um, Spanish pe speaking people here. And I was like, you know what? I really want to learn French. And thankfully, I just follow what is my gut is telling me because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what we all are supposed to do. And um, it was just an inner knowing that I wanted to learn French. Don't know why, but it ended up after I uh, graduated with my social work degree, one of the first jobs I had was working for a community-based organization um, out of Haiti. And then soon after that, Haiti um, had an earthquake and it was in 2010 and it was devastating. And I had an opportunity to go over there and um, be on the ground and within within this Haitian organization um, to be able to work there. And it was a good thing that I knew French. And also I wanted to learn Haitian Creole because I wanted to really meet people where they're at or like people, you know, I can, people knew that I wanted to connect with them. And that's really important to me. So this picture here that you see is when I was there and I took a picture of um, one of the you know places that I had visited and then was able to create this painting. So some of the, um, the, the stories that I tell, I hope they resonate with you because we all have our different paths and we all need to you know follow them based on how we feel and where we know we need to go. All right, so now I've got to figure out how to go to the next page because it's not working. Hmm. Maybe I enter? Nope. Page down? Nope. Sorry. The um, arrow to the right, maybe? Oh, I don't know how that just happened. Okay. Uh, hopefully I'll get it before the end slide. So after I started in 2018, I didn't really, I knew this is what I needed to do now. I've done a lot of done, uh, worked with uh, community-based organizations. I was also, I started teaching as an adjunct at the university here um, in global citizenship. And then it 
everything came together knowing with another knowing that I needed to put my social justice, my social um, motivations into uh, art. Now I had a purpose. Now I knew that I needed to start a business. And at the time in 2018, Andrew Gillum was running against Ron DeSantis for governor. And I don't know, I mean, Ron DeSantis has been a lot, now he's running for president. So he's been a lot in the news. And um, I didn't really know how where I was going to start with my artwork, but I thought, you know, for sure I could paint some shoes promoting Andrew Gillum. Of course he didn't win, but this is where I started. I had to start someplace. So what was inspiring at the time was promoting um, this particular campaign. So from there, ha, huh, that was easy. I thought, okay, I needed to start building some type of portfolio. And so I painted things that were really important to me. I wasn't getting commissions. People didn't even know about me yet. It was just, I had to start someplace. So um, the shoes that are um, on the top left, where you see the children and on the backs of the shoes, it said families belong together because now we are in 2019 and a lot of um, kids are being separated from their families because now Trump has been in office. And even though okay, these things are political um, that I'm speaking of, a lot of times it doesn't matter who has been president because whether it's Republican or Democrat, um, immigration justice has been a uh, um, has been built to have for people to fail. And not that I really knew a lot about immigration, except for the fact that I was listening to the radio and I knew based on my um, my global citizenship knowledge that asylum seekers had a right to seek asylum if they're being persecuted for religion, sexual orientation political views, people had a right. And the United States had signed on to the Declaration of Human Rights and this, all the, the type of covenants that allowed people's rights to be um, to uh, granted. Yet every, you know, people coming into our country were being um, jailed and not allowed to be removed and the children were being separated from their families. So that really, the things that were really, I was really passionate about I was putting on shoes and it was um, a, a release. And it also gave me an opportunity to be able to talk about shoes or talk about the artwork on the shoes. And um, then once I got all the shoes painted and I started my exhibition, I was like, how in the, you know, like I had to figure out how I was going <laughs> to exhibit the shoes. So as you see here, you've got the um, Women's March. You've got girl power, you've got environmental, which is uh, saving our um, saving our earth and also the LGBTQ and the trans color flags, LGBTQIA, um, you know, everything combined for um, for acceptance of all people. So I thought, OK, I'll just hang the shoes and I devised a mobile of um, shoes, you know, hanging from the ceiling. And um, then, of course, I was in an exhibition, was able to talk about the shoes and um, bring stories to the public. After that, uh, we had the 2020 election coming up. And I was really wanting to uh, continue to paint on shoes. Um, but two things here happened as I was working on this um, project. One was that the shoes that you saw before that I painted on were shoes. When I went into the store, I just needed to find some shoes. I needed to start creating. But as I was buying those shoes, the ones prior, I knew that the shoes that I was buying were not ethically made. And we know that a lot of the factories and that make our clothes um, that 
are shipped or are in, most of the factories are overseas, but we do have factories here, especially in reference to our farm workers. Um, they aren't treated fairly. And so not only are the workers not treated fairly, but also the materials used in our uh, are made with a lot of petroleum products. The, the, the companies do not take responsibility of um, taking care of our earth. So with the shoes that I wanted to use for this project on all votes matter, well, I wanted to try to find an ethically responsible shoe manufacturer. And I found some and they were the highest standards, but um, some of them I was just starting, right? And some of them didn't even call me back. But one shoe company um, in Australia, and you'll see the on the uh, red, blue and yellow shoes, the symbol there, that's a Greek symbol. Um, are you probably know it means um, it means I think it stands for ethics or ethical. And so the name of the company is called Etico. And I, I found them. They were willing to work with me. And so I started painting these shoes. The motivation of the second motivation of this project was that the groups that I wanted to uh, highlight were ones that were in my area who had barriers to voting. And uh, the groups that I highlighted were with the yellow, blue, and red were Colombian immigrants. The uh, transform the vote were transgender um, people. The, hand, the purple hands were uh, females formerly incarcerated, and then the eagles were indigenous folk. And the reasons that I chose, there's many besides, you know, beyond Colombian immigrants, beyond just women that formerly incarcerated, all people who have been formerly incarcerated in very a lot of areas, depending on where they live in the states and their laws, will allow or not allow people to vote after they have been incarcerated. So we, um, what I wanted to do is at least find leaders within these particular groups that were willing to talk to me and share their stories. And for that reason, and, and also say, you know, this is what I would like on the shoe. This is what represents um, my group. And we co-designed the shoes together and then they were they shared their story with me, and then I created um, an entire exhibition for the year of 2020, being able to, with their permission, share their stories and highlight the barriers that are in our our county, uh, so that other people that have it easy to vote and don't have a problem finding their um, finding their voting place don't have a problem with their IDs and all the things and all the things that uh, have uh, created barriers for people to be discouraged and not be able to vote, um, to be able to talk about it and see if we could create change within the community at large and also within the communities of these particular groups. So these are just um, some close-ups of the shoes. And additionally, after this project was done, and of course this is mid COVID, right? So what started off at the beginning where I was having exhibitions in public ended up being exhibitions um, on Zoom. And after the um, exhibitions were shown, then I gave these shoes to the people that trusted me with their stories. And this, the indigenous artwork here were ones that the, my indigenous friend had, he's an artist also, or I'm sorry, they are an artist also. And uh, they love the shoes so much, they've never worn them and have put them in the, uh, you know, in a special place, a sacred space, which is an honor to me that they felt that way about the work. So after that, um, I, 
I found uh, fair trade masks that were being made. And of course, this was a really a great time to be making and painting masks for people because everyone was wearing them. And fair trade, if I think you know, I explained it, but you know, in really quick terms and easy terms, is that fair trade uses like when they grow their cotton, they hold the, they keep, they uh, capture water from um, monsoon uh, and storms, and they don't use, they don't deplete the water from people's villages, and um, take, and and they don't pollute it either. And then with, so the cotton is grown in that way. And also the workers don't use uh, child labor. And um, also with the adults, uh, workers, they pay a fair wage. And really all companies should do that. But uh, there's so very few companies that are fair trade and they're more and more growing, of, of course. But um, I try to look for those type companies with all the projects that I do. And these are just more examples of the um, the masks. And also, of course, the uh, paint, the acrylic paint is um, safe. So people didn't breathe in any toxic, toxics or anything, toxins. Um, after uh, the, um, well, during COVID, my sister wrote a book about experiences of a child's view during COVID. And uh, she asked me if I wanted to illustrate. And I was like, mm, I've never done this before. <laughs> and um, I was like, you know, you could probably find somebody with more experience than me. And um, she wouldn't take no for an answer. And so I had an opportunity, I, you know, researched it first in order to know that I could, um, what was expected of a children's book illustrator, they're supposed to tell the story even without the words. And based on the um, illustrations and the book, even though the protagonist is um, a white girl, I wanted the illustrations to be inclusive of all people. So uh, with that in mind and wanting um, it to be, um, to have that type of feel to it, these are the, this is the cover, the front and the back cover of the book. Then part of Painting on Shoes um, word guide out after the exhibition that I had um, uh, displayed the shoes at a, a public uh, resort here um, on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. That particular person happened to know of um, one of the training staff of the Florida Panthers. Now, if I got pan um, hockey fans out there, uh, I don't know if you're going to be <laughs> with the New York Rangers or the Buffalo Sabres or who, but this is um this is the florida panthers and what was interesting about this is that i knew i could paint on shoes right but i've never painted on ccm professional skates and i didn't think i just should start painting on something i didn't even know how you know what the process was going to be so i ordered um like used kids skates that were ccms and um did research on that in order to know how to uh, figure out what was going to be uh, uh, ad adherent to the skates and it was gonna last. I don't think that the person actually wore them, but um, Keith Yandel here, he was like the third all time um, Ironman in reference to the number of games and consecutive games. It was like that he, you know, played in without missing and um, a single game. So I had an opportunity to do this. And I say these things is because you never know what opportunities come up. And even though they may seem scary, um, that if I feel like it's possible that I can do it, and, and a lot of times I'll be, I would go like, well, you know what, let me figure this out and then I can get back with you. And so it's like never not 
uh, accepting an opportunity, but it's also not overstating who I am and what I do, but allowing myself and getting a chance to learn. And those type of skills we can use no matter, you know, what job we're doing and um, what, you know, where we want to go with our lives. So um, now my work is starting to get known more. And uh, one of the, well, actually the curator of this resort, Plunge Beach Resort, uh, she is, the curator is also a ceramicist. And she reached out to me and said, hey, I would like to uh, collaborate. And if I create these ceramic pieces, she would just put the ceramic and mold them on a mannequin. Then uh, would you create, she uh, called, put a call out to create superheroes. And uh, she was going to give me two ceramic busts. And then I were to create the superheroes. And the two superheroes, of course, that, well, the one you can see is uh, Harley Quinn. And the reason I chose her is because after she got tired of the Joker and was like not going to take his crap anymore, and she um, was owning her own empowerment, I thought she's a really good superhero to uh, represent in art. And the other one, this one here, the taller one, this one's called Ova Venger. And it... I was painting this and it came to me, um, the idea and the inspiration is because Roe versus Wade just got overturned and everyone was out in the streets with signs protesting against it. And so what this is, is the if you look down the center it's actually the uterus and the um the fallopian tubes coming around like that the sides of the uh, her armor or their armor are words taken from signs in the streets of all the protests so this particular piece is one of many voices and a lot of emotion in reference to um, people's thoughts and feelings against the overturn of that law. And there it is a little bit more uh, zoomed in. So, other works that I've done, and this is, you know, what's happening in Florida is um, a lot of banning of books and trying to erase history and race and reference to racial justice and people not being uh, professors and universities not being able to teach critical race theory and public schools not able to talk about um, LGBTQ plus uh, uh, questions and people uh, wanting to be able to speak to teachers and be able to talk about their their needs or express themselves and can't read books on it and it's really wrong. So in order for me to feel that because it is so wrong, uh, even though I am one person, and I can't change the laws that are occurring right now, at least I can talk about it. And other people can uh, feel like they're not the only ones that feel that this is wrong. Um, if people ask me questions, at least we can start conversations because a lot of times the you know with the media, everything is done fear-based. And not that I know everything about everything, but if I have a particular, I you know, like with um, going to, to ally groups and uh, different 
opportunities that I have put myself in in positions because I want to learn. I, you know, there should be nobody that I would be like feeling bad towards just because they're a different race. They identify uh, differently than I do in reference to who they are because I've experienced um, negativity and discrimination. So I already know how it feels. Why would I want to do that and think that about other people? And if I want to live in a world that is peaceful, then it's got to start with me. And if my world, if I create my world the way that I see, you know, want the world to be, we can make a big difference in how the world can be. So that's the reason I create these works. It gives me my outlet, my pushback. It makes me feel a lot of positivity knowing that there are other people in the world that feel like me. And the conversations need to be had because it's just a matter of, of, of all of us learning and growing together. So with the, with the um, picture or the um, painting on the left side is a, a stack of books. It's, the entire, it's called Book Freedom. And, the re and I created these titles either based on titles of real books or information or subjects that I wanted to highlight. So 1984. Orwell Society, because George Orwell wrote 1984, Environmental Respect. Florida is a drag because at one point, and I think it's still, in, I'm not sure if, I think that some of the laws have been removed. I'm not sure all of them and how, but in any case, Florida is a drag because they were trying to ban drag shows here and allowing children and families to be able to go to them. Um, we're not gone with the win by always been here. LGBTQIA plus you, trans power, change the world series. Ova Avenger terminates fascism, the superhero of reproductive justice. Roots run deep, race wins by DEI justice. And rise up against holy caustic acts. 2023 and Florida freedom observe the absurd. I know Florida is not the only state, but being that this is where I live <laughs> and work. So with uh, Plunge, the Plunge Beach Resort, that inspired this particular um, work on the right. And that is plunge into integrity, self-respect, I'm sorry, self-reflection, empathy, acceptance, understanding, equity, and peace. If we could all do that, it would be amazing. Okay. With this piece here, um, in 2018, I was getting completely discouraged and feeling completely hopeless when I would hear the news reports on the immigration um, injustice that was being done and the asylum seekers being put in detention centers and being held for years. And a lot of their cases were being wrongfully denied. And, you know, we can go into much more detail on that, but um, cases and like facts that I have in reference to how the judges were being incentivized in order to um, deny cases. Uh, so I got involved in going to seeing these the asylum seekers within detention center because I heard about a volunteer group. And um, I was like, wow, I don't know what I've done. I'm, I'm going to do here. I don't know what to expect. But I am going to go because I know asylum seekers are not, this is completely wrong. And uh, so I went, I connected with people and when you're stuck in detention, how can you get your paperwork and everything you need to do to prove your case for asylum? So I was able to try to find lawyers, 
uh, immigration lawyers for people and um, connect with their families if they couldn't, if they didn't have money in order to connect with them. Some of the families didn't even know where they were, if they were safe or not after coming across the border and trying to um, seek asylum or ask for asylum. And uh, it was a super meaningful opportunity for me to learn and to understand what the immigration system is about. And then after some of the, this particular person, Loveland, she, um, I never, I never met her in detention, but when she got to the southern border of Mexico, she I got a call from her. I picked up the phone because I knew it was a um, international number, and she asked if I could at least find her an attorney once she got to the northern border of Mexico to be able to have somebody be there for her. And um, I did. I was able to find, based on the connections that I had um, I had created or been able to um, learn about um, because I was in this type of like immigration justice network, um, could find an attorney for her at the border. And um, so her story in particular was um, successful and she's now has been granted asylum, but now it's like all the... Um, money still involved in paying her immigration attorney because they, uh, you know, some are quite expensive as well as um, trying to make ends meet with rent and food and uh, getting, finding jobs that are going to be able to pay. So after like a couple of years ago, I created this piece as a fundraiser for her in order to well, ask her, I was like, listen, because you need money, if you like, I can tell you, I can create a painting and use it as a fundraiser in order for, um, for, you know, for um, people to know about your story and um, they can donate to you um, and you're, you'll be able to pay for your attorney and all of those things. And she was like, she really liked the idea. So I asked her if she would, you know, what she wanted me to tell her story about. She told me what she wanted. I drafted it for her. She liked the draft and then I painted it. And what the story represents is you see in the upper right hand corner, um, the Muslim Brotherhood. They um, were chasing, they, her and her girlfriend were in a, a cafe bar and the Muslim Brotherhood came in and caught them together. Uh, they attacked both of um, Loveland and her girlfriend, but her girlfriend stood in front of Loveland as a shield to prevent her from Loveland from getting hurt. They killed her girlfriend and Loveland was able to escape. So she left her country in Africa, um, traveled to the northern part of um, the Darien Gap, traveled through the northern part of South America, through um, Central America on into the southern border of Mexico. When she called me, which is, there's the phone. I know it's not a cell phone, but it's very, it's, it gives them a, a more effective <laughs> um, uh, design for a phone. The Tree of Life, is her opportunity to start a new life here in the US. And the cat that sits up there on the limb was a cat that her and her girlfriend had um, had together. And so it represents that. So that's the story of Loveland. And so now this painting, Loveland will get, and that's part of my work too, just like with the shoes, when people tell me their story, it's not, I don't feel like it's my right to then turn around and sell their work based on that story. So as a thank you for them, for me being able to do this type of work, I give them the piece of art. And when she ends up uh, finding a place and she wants it, then I will send it to her. 
in February 2023, this year, I also wanted to do an exhibition on immigration justice. And I wanted to draw parallels between persons being denied asylum when they're from the countries of Africa more than other uh, other countries, as well as the barriers put in place within the United States of the black community that live here. And there are a lot of barriers on both accounts. The black community that are US citizens that have been here for centuries and the newly arriving Africans wanting asylum. So with this particular exhibition, because it was in February, because it was Black History Month, I also wanted to collaborate with other artists, other Black artists. So they, um, Oral and Caroline, um, were able to, we were able, we were able to co-present at this particular, with this particular project. And it was very, very impactful. And every day in February, I drew parallels of the, of this, you know, the exhibition between the two communities of on the black community, African-Americans, as well as newly arrived Africans to show the parallels and hopefully use those um, posts for people to learn more about uh, the insights that I've been given in order to um, bring attention and acceptance for people. So I did three, I spoke with three people. And of course I know a lot of people that have been seeking asylum in the US and would reach out to them and say, you know, the same as I did with Loveland, would you like your story told? And if you do, um, please let me know what you want. With doctor, he is, he was a licensed physician, but he just happened to disagree with the political views and spoke out against the, um, the government within his country. And for that reason, he was um, being arrested and tortured and he escaped, but here's his story. And then I put, he actually drew this on the paper and uh, sent it to me. And then I duplicated it on the shoes, found out what size shoes he wanted. These are the Etico shoes, the um, fair trade uh, manufactured shoes. And, um, that is uh, one of, I did three, represented three people. And so he was one that I had visited here in Broward County. And he had written me letters because at the time he had already wanted shoes a few years ago. And so he kept, he would write me letters on everything that he wanted and wanted to remember in his experiences being in ICE detention in the U.S. So I took, I saved the letters and then finally put them on shoes for him. And they, all of the people that I'm showing you here have their shoes now. And then Lom, he was um, in his country uh, where he had gone to take care of his sick cousin. And when he arrived off the bus at the place, the city where his cousin lived, there was a, a revolt of university students there, um, a protest, and he was caught up in the protest and then um, um, had issues with um, imprisonment in his country. And that's why he left but his goals, and he will continue to search for these goals or um, want to um, make his dreams come true is that he wants to be a soccer player because he's really good at soccer. And he also wants to um, learn to be a doctor. So the other types of work that I've done are community projects. And these are ones like um, this where I want to bring particular attention to 
families who live in neighborhoods that are underserved and not um, not getting adequate resources in order to have um, the things that they need um, and not by any fault of their own, but just because of how our systems are set up. So I applied, I thought of this project, I applied for a grant and got the grant. And what it is, is that this particular YMCA in Fort Lauderdale uh, was built on the first black, the land where the first black hospital was, um, was in Broward County. And so it's historical land is being honored by um, this particular uh, YMCA named after L.A. Lee and the Mizell Center. I believe Dr. Mizell was one of the doctors in that worked in the hospital, I believe, but he is honored on this building. And this first year in 2021, um, it, this particular project got chosen and what it was for and his purpose is that the families could uh, come with their children and write words and images of a family member who had passed. And within the cis trunk area and then in the surrounding communities, it was really important because this has been a devastated type. It was like the community where um, the black people had to live because they weren't allowed to cross the tracks and live in the white communities during segregation. So there's a lot of hurt and a lot of pain that come from this area. And I thought it would be a healing project in order for families to be able to honor their folk that have passed. And it ended up being really, really, really re uh, well recepted, received by the families. And uh, what we did is that this particular, this is like a, maybe like a eight foot by six foot um, canvas with the, the words, their souls live on. And then all of the shoes there were the ones that were painted by the families in order to on, in order to honor their family member. And um, the actually this particular mural is still on display. That it's um, it's been um, so well received that they still want it to hang up there in the uh, in the YMCA. And here are the families um, painting. And with the when I do these type of projects, when I get the paints and the the pencils and the erasers and all of the uh, supplies that are needed in order to have to create these type of projects, I um, they are able all the families whatever pro whatever supplies they use they can take them home because an important saying to me and one that I I is really true is that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And as long as we can continue to provide opportunity, then people have an opportunity to find their creativity and explore opportunities that perhaps they didn't have a chance to explore. And that's part of the power that I want to use with my projects is that uh, to give those type of opportunities to people. So these are some of the uh, this, some of the feedback that I got from the family is that the project took conversations and emotions and placed them into artwork that will last for a long time. Each she represents an individual story, but the collective tells a story also. The installation causes people who see it to reflect on their own family members that they continue to honor even in their absence. And it says yes. I feel like this project has assisted us as an, on an individual level to see where we need to heal and what we need to work on. This project has helped to identify pieces of ourselves we have forgotten and to build on our strengths and strengthen our weaknesses. So this particular project here, Soccer for All, Fair trade, community art workshops, public showcase event, and soccer game. 
this is just happening. And this picture here on the far right with the kids, this happened this past Saturday, December the 2nd. And it was another opportunity to apply for a grant and be able to purchase these soccer balls here that are on, you know, that you see these bright yellow ones. And it just so happens that you see the fair trade symbol. That's what I've been talking about. This soccer manufacturing company, I don't know what it is about Australia, but it uh, keep getting brought back to Australia for all these companies that are honoring fair trade, no child or adult labor, and they're not polluting the earth. And of course, with the manufacturing, there's a, there is a carbon emission footprint. And for, for that reason, for every ball here manufactured, they plant a tree. So this particular project is involving 24 kids. So already 24 trees have been planted in, um, in regards to this project. So like the skates, the ice skates that I painted on, I had no idea what how I was gonna paint on soccer balls and if they would get played with, bounced with, kicked with, that the paint was gonna stay. So I had to um, figure that one out with help from the actual paint manufacturer <laughs> to find out what, you know, what I was thinking, is it going to work and all of that. And so I did a sample ball there in the middle of the um, inter um, Miami team, um, the, uh, the uh, National Soccer League there. So um, everything can work out and we don't know where our lives are going to go, but we just keep trying and pushing and go and following um, living the world that we want to live. And it does bring me hope. It brings us all hope. And that's the thing is like, when we say we can't, you know, we're just one person, but as long as I'm doing the work and, and living the world I want, just like we all have that way about us, it does change the world. And even though things can be negative, I don't have to be negative and I don't have to be an excuse for others to be negative. And then we can all be that energy and power of peace. We can all be superheroes in order to make the world a better place. And here's my information. And if you, there's probably questions which I'm happy to answer, but you can take down, take a photo of this. If ever you want to ask questions or talk to me or have any ideas or suggestions, I'm open to it. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Vicky, for being our artist today. It is our pleasure to uh, share this time together. Next Monday, before we go to the q and I'd like to just uh, give a good little information here. Uh, it's going to be holistic meditation coaches, Michelle Anglisano and Kristen McDermott. And they will discuss the spread and inspire change around you through the simple act of loving kindness. This presentation next Monday, December 11th, is the fall 2023 season closing event and we'll also be presenting the Artivist Award then, sponsored by Sim for Hope. We hope that you are able to join us. Uh, for more information on this and all of the series class and upcoming events, please go to the website, www.adelphi.edu slash artivism. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram at Artivism for Shared Humanity, or just simply Google Artivism and Transformation. Our YouTube channel is Artivism, the number four, Shared Humanity. Also, if you would like to get more involved in this ongoing initiative, please contact the Artivism team. Now, I would like to ask uh, if you have any questions for our artists, please raise your hand or mute yourself or ask the question in the chat. And here I'll ask uh, Professor Arjit to give us a hand because I did see a couple of the questions in the chat already. And perhaps yeah. we can start a conversation that way. I do have some. 
Um, your artwork is amazing. On several, how long does it usually take for you to finish painting shoes on canvas? Oh, great question. Uh, it varies, of course, based on design. And if, you know, the more detailed the design, the more detailed it takes. And, um, but there are some shoes that have taken, I don't know, a week to complete, like the indigenous shoes. And it's so detailed. And also like, a, everything goes in layers because, uh, if I, you know, like I, I sketch the design on there, then I do a thin layer to make sure that everything's going to lay out good and, and do it right. And then I create, you know, I keep doing layers that way. And uh, what's really nice about the shoes also is that they have fabric fixative in them. So it stays on the shoes. Mm -hmm. I did, I have a friend who's in their 90s. And she wears her shoes like all the time. And like, I mean, she's a go, I mean, like she wears them in South Carolina muck. Like she gets mud all over them. She's washed them and the shoes are going to disintegrate before the paint ever comes off. There were many comments about the shoes. I think that those left a, the, the greatest impact. I think what, what takes a lot of time also is not just the actual painting of the shoes, but really coming up with what are you going to paint? How are you going to be putting it together? That's like half the time, right? It's not just sitting down and getting it done. It's getting your thoughts in order and the planning stages out. Um, yeah. I really enjoyed this presentation, especially, of course, the shoes, painting and painted masks, the painting on them, paintings on them were inspirational. Again, I'm interested about the project with the shoes. How long did it take, which you answered, and how much did it cost? Huh, great question. If, of course, the ones that were done for people's stories, as you know, cost nothing for them. Mm. When they're commissioned, then I've had shoes up to like $2,400, $2,400 based on um the um the detail mm -hmm. let's see the shoes were such an amazing concept and what you do is so inspirational i love mm -hmm. how you were able to do self-reflection on your work and it shows that you are able to hold yourself accountable and stand for what you believe in that's amazing that is amazing <laughs> yeah that's not you got you got whoever said that has got me. And it's like it's who we have to be. It's not just, you know, it's what we all work for, right? To have yeah. that courage and the confidence and the humility at the same time to be able to say, no, I don't know. I want to learn and own it. We just own ourselves and where we're at and continue to grow. I mean, we never stop growing. Then there are others that say you are truly inspirational. A few love the Florida Panther skates. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, your presentation was excellent. Together with the skates, the shoes were what I liked best. I thought the children's book and the painted masks had really lovely illustrations. Thank you. Yeah. And the balls, they love the balls. <laughs> yeah. They can come back, continue to come back to the social media sites because that, Yes. Yes, it's still in, in going on. I've got the next workshop next Saturday. We're going to have scrimmage games of soccer in uh on January 12th. So I'll be posting that. And what's really cool about that is that um well, I came up with the idea of soccer because I found the fair trade soccer balls and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll create mm -hmm. a community project for that. This particular and so I'm like, where am I gonna what where do I go? to find a place that I'm, that's gonna want to create a community workshop for kids and have them play soccer. And I thought, well, I'll go to this next town that's right near, right next to Fort Lauderdale. And it was the city of Pompano Beach. And I'll go to their parks and recs apartment. And I was like, this is what I'd like to do. Would you like to do that for 
your, you know, one of your recreation centers. Mm -hmm. And they say, I know just the one. Um, they, they, um, the director has been wanting to do a soccer program for the kids forever. Oh, nice. So what ends up happening is that this particular McNair Recreation Center has been, com this community neighborhood has been completely underserved. The kids don't have soccer balls at their house. Mm -hmm. And they just, the city of Pompano just built new soccer, a soccer field there. So now the kids get their own soccer ball. They get their own paint supplies because they're painting on the soccer balls. They get to become the inaugural soccer team of the McNair Recreation Center. And all of this is just because I happened to go to this particular right. place and all of this happens. And it just so happens to be that the McNair Recreation Center is where um, Lamar Jackson, the quarterback of the Baltimore Ravens, um, went to uh, he was on their football team there. Very yeah, they, interesting. Oh, here's an, one interesting, another interesting one. There were so many pieces that really stood out to me throughout your presentation, but the one, sorry, uh, but the one uh, that stood out to me the most was the painting on the body that was in response to the Roe versus Wade being overturned. This reminded me of the idea of holding a protest or fundraiser through a runway where the models wear pieces of art that send a message. Have you ever thought about painting on clothes in this way? No, I've heard of that before and I've never like taken it in to um, think about doing it myself. So mm. I appreciate that idea, whoever gave that. That's great. There, there is also, what is your process for getting the stories people want to create the art? In reference to like the um, uh, person seeking asylum, mm -hmm. I just ask them, I let them know what I, I can do. And without there being any, any like um, incentive for them, except if they want to tell their story. And do they want to share it in order to um, create a connection of allowing change for asylum seekers. A lot of the ones that I've painted are like, listen, I don't want anybody this to happen to anyone else. If we could change the system here, that would be great. If we can use my story to help change that system, we would, it would be great. And based on that, and I asked them to draw drafts, draw words, what they want so I can take, I don't put like anything, I don't create anything that doesn't come from them, that they, their story is in their hands. They, they have the power in order for me to do what they want me to do with that. And then every step of the way I get their approval and then they get the shoes and, the, and, and as a thank you. I hope I answered the question. Did I? I think so. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was also wondering about uh, the interdisciplinary work that you do, right? Because you have the social work background and also the arts background. I know we have a couple of people in the audience that have that dichotomy as well. And uh, most of society is always telling you pick one, pick the other, there's this, there's that. But you've been able to mingle the two in such a way that it's the art or a social cause. Uh, can you tell us a little more about that, please? Uh, that's a great question. And when I first got my social work degree, I did not think I was going to do art with it, right? I just I thought I was definitely going to work for um, some, like in an area. I knew I wasn't going to work one-on-one -on -one with people or in groups or with families, but with organizations. and that was my focus. So I, you know, and in, even then working with the community organizations that worked in the communities that were trying to fill in the gaps of our society to make mm -hmm. the world more equitable, um, getting that learning under my belt, then that's when it allowed me to start teaching as an adjunct 
on like global citizenship efforts and ideas and causes. And it was just almost like an accumulation of things. And then it's like, I got to a point and I'm like, you know what? It almost like an epiphany. <laughs> now I know what to do with my art. I've been doing this for all of these organizations and I'm, I'm starting to get an, an understanding of being able to transform this feeling and sense of justice into my talent. And it kind of just meld together. But anything, and even though it was like 2018, like it took a long time for me to realize mm -hmm. this is where I need to go. But none of that time up until this point of, you know, 2018 was wasted time because it was all building on each other in order for me to get to where I needed to be. And, and I hope I answered that question right, because now I do use the social justice, my social work. That's a part of social work mm -hmm. is the sense of social justice and what we're supposed to do. And even when I was going into social work, the, you know, the getting my degree and they were like, no, you should be taking Spanish, even though I do want to learn Spanish. But at the time, I, I really knew I needed to learn French. And it was like just being able to stay on my path. And and even though like, you know, people, even artists will say, and I'll say this because it, it parallels with anything anybody feels about what they want to do with their life. I want to do this kind of art. And a lot of times people will say, why are you going to do that? It, you know, in question what they want to do. And it's like, so then they doubt themselves and or I've doubted myself and, you know, shouldn't I, you know, should I think about this a different way? And then it all comes back. Eventually they end up doing the art that they always wanted to do or what they felt like doing. And so it's almost like trying to figure out how we can make what we know that we are is inside of us come to fruition. Yeah, and apropos to that, and the global citizens that you keep mentioning, could yes. you tell us a little more about this global citizenship, please? Yes, I um, I kind I sort of created my my own developed my own course work with it, and um, the last quarter that or semester that I taught that particular class was it took I'm trying now to remember the um it I'll I'll let you the things that come into my mind is that um I did experiential learning with the class where the students could uh sign up and and those that are coming uh uh, refugees that are coming like now it was Ukraine or um, other um, uh, countries that were, you know, the U.S. was bringing here in order to settle them, resettlement. The students had an opportunity to work with the resettlement agency and the um, students had an opportunity to learn the stories and to work firsthand with the, 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 uh, the, you know, the trials and tribulations that come from um, being um, in opposition to whatever the governmental powers were at that time. So it was a learning. And uh, also, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. But primarily, the, the things that I'm talking about in reference to um, the disconnection of uh, why countries are the way that they are in reference to how corporations um go into other countries, U.S. corporations or, uh, you know, of, of more like, I guess, developed countries go into underdeveloped countries and the reasons that they take advantage of the governments there and the um, the abuses of the environment in order to make cheap products and those type of things to draw the connections between how the world really works and to, to know that the, um, like being, the you know a U.S. citizen is no. It's like we are all in this together. Our, we have an interconnection with our world, and uh, that what happens here in the U.S. affects the rest of the world and vice versa. 
And I'm sure everybody gets that because of how how much we're connected via the internet and how much you that you see. But really what's important about that is not not believing one side of the story, but if um, by learning more, not just accepting one blurb and thinking, oh my, you know, and, and that's the truth. But we do our own investigation in order to find a well-rounded understanding of what really is going on. And uh, even with the Israeli and the Palestinian crisis, there is good and like the bad, like, you know, there's a whole story there that, you know, we're only knowing parts of it. And like, just to have that open view in order to not just completely, you know, discriminate and make it easy just to say, oh, this is how it is. And not know that, you know what, there is always more to the story. Definitely. Yes. And Ms. Vicky, as always, thank you for your support with uh, Artivism as audience member and as a presenter, as an advocate for Artivism throughout the world for a better society. And as you know, here we have the tradition of closing the event with a key takeaway for action. Now it's your turn. What is your key takeaway for action after this marvelous presentation? For me or for, for all of us? For the audience say that you would like to leave us with an action item to consider putting into action. I think what I just what I, I just finished saying, and that is, is that we, you know, we live in such a um to always consider the more to the story without us having the emotion of cutting people off or just having negative views, because we are all, I mean, there could be there, people can be filled with so much hate out in the world and not just take that is that, you know, to understand where the hate comes from, from fear and that we all have can relate to each other and us not to push back so negative and, and, you know, violently, like in, uh, not just not, not like violent physical, but emotionally that we discard people because, um, it takes more to understand or try to feel like, you know what, they must be really upset and to have compassion as much as we can. Yes, yes, so that's uh, an ultimate goal, God willing for our society to move forth, to have that compassion, that empathy, like you said earlier, to be able to walk in someone else's shoes, to connect, right? Yeah. I have Professor Argy, would you like to do us the honors of closing today's event, please? <laughs> sure. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Thank you so much, Vicky, for this inspiring presentation. I think everyone loved the, uh, you know, walking in the shoes and their souls walk on and, uh, you know, all the graphics and the message behind it all. Um, thank you to our sponsors, Sing for Hope. Adelphi University, Gottesman Libraries Teachers College, and of course, Carolina Campanero Varela. We hope to see you again next week will be our closing presentation as um, Carolina um, announced a little bit earlier. Uh, and of course, um, next week we will announce the recipient of the Sing for Hope sponsored Artivist Award. So hope to see you there. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It and hope to see you back, Vicky, with more. Oh, I will. And can you save the chat? Yes, I will. Perfect. Thanks a lot, because I didn't get you now, actually. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.